questions and things you can directly ask her we are putting this more in a form where you can uh, understand and ask your queries directly uh, to your mentor she's also uh, as a mentor to a lot of startups at eic snu over to you shalu thank you shiva um you know it's really an honor to be here and um, i was very uh, enthusiastic and very excited to you know to address a gathering of entrepreneurs and the startup people because there's a lot of energy and enthusiasm that you can see uh, in this set of people it takes a lot of courage um, to start up um, at least i don't have that courage so i really feel happy to meet this set of people um so you know uh i was thinking what i'm going to talk about in this session and then i started thinking about the valuation models and then i also started thinking about okay these are the set of people who are going to be meeting the angel investors or micro vcs in their journey towards you know getting the funding and the valuation process so i thought you know before we start of uh start talking i would like to show you a deck where i would you know like to put up how the vcs actually look at the valuation and how does this valuation game actually happens at for the early stage startups um so i let me just you know give me a minute and i will share this deck so is can you see my screen yes we can so right so so i'm going to talk about like i said i'm going to talk about the early stage startups uh, how does this valuation game happen so why i'm calling it a game is what you know we'll figure it out in the next couple of minutes uh, and how do vcs actually look at the valuation of the startups so uh, you know i also figured out okay why are we doing this session because suddenly there are a lot of startups that's happening in india the startup ecosystem in india has changed and you don't need to pick up a newspaper to figure that out uh, you just you know turn your head around and you see a lot of excited uh, people who are actually working on an idea and then they are doing a startup so you know and, and if you read the um, literature that's there about the startups the startups ecosystem that starts to bloom doesn't happen in isolation there are a lot of support there is an infrastructure support that goes along with it and the main this thing is the vc investment so if you look at the latest trend of vc investment in india uh, it's it's very very uh, it's blooming and it's not been squibbed or damped by the pandemic and that's something which is very very enthusiastic for the or exciting for the entrepreneurs so if we see there is a been a strong deal flow there has been a lot of fundraising and it is an all time high there was 3 billion dollar which was raised by raised by india focused vc funds in 2020 which was a 40% growth over 2019 and there have been a lot of growth in the startups now when i say valuation of the early stage startups um, so there are a lot of models that you know um, that i looked around um these is the list of the models that you can see on the slide and i'm not going to talk about any of them okay because i figured out these models are there uh, i mean our startup incubators can go access these models if they need to shalu uh, we right? can't see your slides moving is that me only and if you can put it on the full screen mode yeah oh, i had put it on the full screen mode let me share it again then now can you see shiva is it visible yes yes it is okay so i'm sure you would have heard one or two or multiple valuation models among these models um they are very popular among the startup community um but when you look at these vcs they actually use none of these valuation models valuations and fred wilson 
actually said, who is a very, um, you know, very popular VC, he said that the early stage valuations aren't actually valuations. They are the exhaust fumes of a negotiation about two things, the amount raised and the amount of dilution. Okay, here he's talking about dilution of the equity. So what does startup mean in finance or in valuation? Startup is an investment uh, which involves an upfront payment today by a VC or by any other investors for the, uh, you know, for, for the labor of the founder, for the business idea, for the uh, amount of time that has been put by the founder. And what do they expect in return is a higher financial resource at a later stage. So why is, when we talk about startup valuation, why do we talk it in a different term? Why, why valuation for startup has to be, you know, is a separate topic altogether? Because when we look at value of a firm, it's divided, it can be divided into two parts. One is value of assets in place, and the other is the value of growth potential. For a startup, startup derives its value from entirely the growth potential. There is absolutely, you know, very little that comes from the assets in place. And the startups have a lot of information constraints in the terms of there is very little limited history that is there. Um, not much is known about you know their financial or uh, 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 financial performance. The financial statements reveal very less. In fact, you know it changes not only changes from quarter to quarter, it changes from month to month and sometimes changes from week to week. So there's very little that you can actually figure out from their um business statement or a financial statement and most of them not all of them but a lot of them use the first i mean uh, their business model or their business is kind of very unique and it's very difficult for sometimes you know for the vcs or the investor to fathom what is that they are actually trying to figure it out so what determines the startup value and what happens when you go to a vc so typically when you go to a vc um especially at an early stage we see they have a target valuation money uh, they have a target valuation also and they have a, a range of the money that they want to invest in so in indian market typically it ranges from somewhere you know um, one to one and a half million dollar at the early stage pre-seed pre or seed staging and then they also have a range for the equity that they want in terms of the money that they are investing let it ranges somewhere between 10 to 20 percent actually it ranges somewhere between 15 to 20 percent because it's going to get diluted at each and every stage and they know that so they need at least eight to ten percent you know when the exit actually happens depending upon the founder depending upon the team depending upon you know what's the business idea there is a valuation that the vcs do and at this point of time, there are a few things that determine the value of the startup, right? One is how hot is the industry? Is it really blooming? Because for a startup, if you understand, for a VC, if you look at the VC business, they invest in 10 companies and they're expecting only one or two to be successful. So if they expect only one or two to be successful or maximum three to be successful out of 10. They actually want to invest in a company which is high growth. If you look at any valuation model, especially VCF, the valuation actually comes from growth potential. So the higher the growth potential, the more interested a VC is going to be invested in a company. So if an industry is growing, there is a chance. Uh, and in fact, the probability of the company getting a substantial market is very, very high if the industry is growing. So if we look into 2020 uh, in India, 75% of the VC investment went to the top three sectors, which was um, FinTech, SaaS, and consumer technologies. And if we look here, um, actually it was uh, SaaS and education, one was EdTech and uh, food technology, these were the three sectors. There were growth in deal size, there were growth in deal volumes, the number of deals decreased, but the deal size increased in these three sectors. So what I'm trying to say here is 
higher growth is something which is very, very important for a VC to be considered. The second is the demand and supply constraint. I don't know how many of you have watched Shark Tank, um, but if you look at it, it's all about you know, supply and demand. So what's that supply here? Supply is, of course, the startups. Who are the people who are demanding? The demand of the VCs. The higher the VC, so if you're talking about the capital here, they are increasing in India. The number of VCs are higher, more. And they're, if they are willing to give you capital, if they're willing to give capital to a startup, the valuations will soar. Okay. So it depends upon how many VCs are there. And if you look at the Indian landscape, uh, the number of micro VCs in India, which is the early stage, which actually give money to the seed stage funding, it increases from 29, increased from 29 in 2014 to 89 in 2020. The amount of capital that has been infused by micro VCs has also increased from 346 million, right? So the amount of capital is increasing, the number of VCs are increasing, and hence there is more capital, there is more supply of the capital, and this impacts the valuation of the startups, right? Now, what happens when the valuation of a startup happens or when the VC actually does the valuation of a startup? First, the first question is, why do you need a valuation? So a startup looks starts looking for a valuation only and only when they need money, right? So when they need money, they go to the VC and the VC then does the valuation. When the VC does the valuation, and because of the multi-stage valuation that is happening nowadays, the VCs want to invest only sufficient money which can sustain a startup till the next round of funding. Okay. So for a startup, it's very important for them to figure out how much money will they need to sustain to the next round of funding. Because if you look at the data, almost around 70 to 80%, depending upon which report you are reading, Indian startups fail in spite of getting funding because they don't go to the next round of funding. They're not able to sustain till the next round of funding. That's because they don't have an idea about how much money do they need for the next round of funding. It's not an easy figure to figure out. It's not as if the startups knows, it's not a figure that even the VCs know. Okay. It's an estimate, but you have to be good at that estimate. When you go to a VC, you have to have a story where you show a growth which is exponential because VCs are not interested in investing in a company which has a low growth potential. Okay. There are a few other things that help in determining and getting pushing up the valuation of a startup. Uh, the one of the most important of them is the reputation or the team. The founders, the team that is driving the startup is very, very important. Most of the times VCs invest in the people. Okay, They need to have a confidence that if they're investing in a startup, the team should be actually able to execute and implement that idea. The other things that actually can help is if you have a traction, uh, if you have a prototype, so a prototype helps in, you know, whether uh, in showing that the, there is a viability of the product um, and the product actually exists. If there are any existing revenues, it actually helps. Distribution channel also is very important. So when you're making a product, when you're putting up for valuation, distribution channel exhaust, you know, takes in a lot of funding. And this is something which startups generally are not aware of sometimes. And therefore, a lot of VCs do not invest in B2C products because there the distribution channels becomes very expensive. And it, you know, the margins decrease. So if the margins are low, VCs typically shy away from these kind of startups. So how does multi-party staging work? So there is a multi-party staging uh, which is there and this data is very India specific. But I'm showing it to you. If you look at the firms that started 
maybe 15 years before and the startups right now, you will see that there is an increased amount of duration when the company started till the time they are listed onto the market or they do an IPO. Okay. So if you look at Amazon, there was a gap of around four to five years, but nowadays the gap is somewhere around seven to 10 years. Why is this gap increased? This gap is increased because VCs are now involved in the multi-party staging. It's not one VC which invest, wait till the IPO of the firm that happens and then exits. What's happening is there are VCs that are involved in each and every stage. The exit happens later which helps the VCs or the funders or the investor, whatever we call them, from the pre-seed uh, stage to the later stage stages to get the maximum value of their money that they have invested. Now, how does this multi-stage, multi-party staging works is there is a VC that comes in at the starting phase. When a VC comes at the starting phase, there is not much that's known about the startup. They don't know whether the startup will actually work or not work. They don't know whether the startup, uh, you know, will grow, not grow, whether what will be the margins, how much investment that would will be known. So you get a sense of about, you know, that none of the valuation model will work in this case. You know, so when you were talk about a valuation model, you need to have an estimate about the expected cash flow. You need to have an idea about how these cash flows will vary, that's essentially the risk. And what is the return that's expected? But while you may know what is the return that is expected, you don't know anything about the investment that will be required. You don't know what the, whether the, how much will be the growth. So essentially the early stage VCs are backing on the team. They are backing on the size of the problem that you are after. And they are backing on the ability of the team to execute the service or the product that they are creating to be to make it successful. So these are the three things where the VCs look for and then they put in the money. So sometimes, you know, they're convinced that, you know, that the startup will reach the next stage of funding in one million, let's say one million dollar. Uh, and they say, OK, 20 percent is the equity that we want. So it, for them, it's very important that they take a higher amount of equity or a stake because it's going to get diluted. So, so if it's like one million, they are actually looking at a valuation of a five million dollar. Sometimes they figure out, okay, they might need more money, and this valuation, this company may have a higher growth rate. What they do is they may invest in a one point five million dollar, and then the equity stake can be fifteen percent. So, but they have a range. Each VC has a range of the money that they're going to invest and the equity that they're going to ask in for that, in the return for that money that they're going to invest. All they're looking for is how to get you or how to get that startup to the next stage of funding. That's their goal. Now, this multi-party staging is not too bothered about whether the valuation is right or not because at every stage it gets corrected and at every stage it becomes a little more precise so as it keeps moving on from one stage to another from pre-seed to seed to series a to series b the number of startups actually keep on dropping the successful startups keep on decreasing and the valuations, of course, keep on converging to the listed entities. Now, how does the VC valuations actually work is, um, um, this is just an example that I thought I'll show you. So when a VC figures out at a later stage, so this is a, a little third stage or you know, series A, series B, that you know after five years the expected revenue is going to be 200 million and the expected net income will be five million dollars so they look at a comparable this thing of a price earning ratio of 30 and they figure out okay when the firm will be listed after five years the expected value of the firm is going to be around 150 million dollars 
And if I want a target return of 30%, my valuation at that point will be 40.40. So that's how they look at the valuation of a later stage startup, but at the early stage startup, none of the valuation models are actually used. Then we look at how does the convergence happens with the listed companies. So there are three things, um, actually there are two things that happen. One is revenue predictability increases. At the early stage startups, it's very highly unpredictable. Later growth startups have a high predictability uh, or a medium predictability, but a listed entities will have the highest predictability. The growth rate of early stage startup will be very, very high. For a late growth startup, it's going to be high. But for a listed entities, if you look at the growth rate, it's ranges between two to 10%. Like I said, you look at any valuation model, the value is derived from the growth. If you change the growth rate of a company by 5%, the valuation of a company changes significantly. The maximum impact in the valuation is created by the growth rate of the company. And that is why when you approach a VC, it's important that you have a growth rate, which is astronomical. Okay. Now, at the initial stage, when nothing is known about the company, the valuation is derived via you know, negotiations like uh, what I, we, I showed you in my initial slide. It was in, it's, it's actually a negotiation that keeps on happening, right? So when the VCs actually figure out that they have to value a company, they just, just don't, it's not like, okay, they come up with the arbitrary figure. Of course, there is a story that's written there. And that story is written on an Excel sheet. So you have to get that story on your Excel sheet right. Okay, what do you need to concentrate on your story on your Excel sheet? Growth rate. How much reinvestment you would need? Because what I figure out is sometimes these startups don't forget that they need to reinvest. You will have to reinvest and you need to put that in your Excel sheet. How do you branch out each and every expense that you incur? According to, you know, most of the financial laws, rules, regulations that you see, our financial, how our financial statements are made, most of the expenses are put up in the operating expense. I'll just give you an example. If you buy a product from a startup, you get a card which tells you about the company. It tells you about, you know, why this product is good. They do a wonderful packaging. And do you put it as an operating cost? You put it as a because, you know, for every product that is sold, that cost is incurred. No, that's an advertising that you're doing. So I will not put it as an operating cost. Put it as a capital expense. The benefit of this expense that you're incurring will be accrued for a later period of years. So it's very important that you have a story and that story is backed by the numbers. The numbers need to be shredded to every smaller particle and put everything, if, try to bring down everything into a capital expense. I'm not saying, you know, uh, do window dressing, but figure that out. That's something very, very important. When your startup becomes successful, when the late growth startups happen, the models are TCF, public supply, uh, public market comparables that are happening. And that's how the uh, late growth startups actually have, a, you know, a, actually a wallet valuation model where you look at expected revenue and all the valuation models are implied. The other thing with the, mm, that, that sometimes, you know, uh, spoils the party for a startup is when sometimes a most, I mean, the founders don't exit, but the VCs exit, okay? Even the valuations are high. The VC exiting is seen as such a negative signal that the valuation key of a startup crashes down, okay? So, there may, you may have a very successful startup, $150 million is the valuation, you have a 30% stake, which gives you a, makes your net worth as $45 million, but you can't exit that. It's only on the paper until unless the phone is listed. 
So there is no liquidity in startups. You only invest and invest. So, you know, that brings me, that brings me to summarize. I, um, when you're looking at an early stage startup, the VCs don't follow any models. There are no models that need to be followed. You need to have a story and that story needs to be absolutely airtight. That story needs to focus on growth. That story needs to focus on your capability. That story needs to focus on your ability to execute. It's important that you recognize the VC power law curve. What is this VC power law curve? We, there is a multi-stage party that's there. Every VC is connected to this VC. So, so every VC is have a have have like they will invest in only early stage startup. Some will invest Series A. Some will do Series B, and that's the target. And they're connected. So a Series A VC will be connected to its previous VC and to VC later. A VC. So if you approach a VC where it has a higher networking or he is or he or she is able to get funding more it's important to be able to connect to that vc a lot of these lot of startups don't go to the next round of funding because the vcs did not have enough networking it's very important that not only you are capable your vc has to have good networking there is a law power curve that's there. So concentrate on the growth and be the rocket ship. Uh, I had, you know, sl uh, so slides for the discounted cash flow model and how it will work. But I thought, you know, it's important for me to talk about how the valuation model or the valuation games actually happen when the VCs, uh, when the startups start investing when the VCs actually how they do up uh, rather than you know talking about the different valuation models which are actually not followed in the early stage startup. The DCF valuation model works but it works only in the later stages and only for the listed companies and for the last you know for the first five six years um, the VCs you you got to be you know uh, playing that game of valuation with the VCs and the uh, and and be a player in that multi-stage um, funding. Great, great. I think, Shalu, that's uh, amazing information. Everyone will definitely take make use of it. Uh, we have a couple of questions in the chat box. Uh, if we can quickly have a look on that, or should I read it out? Uh, there is a question from Yogesh, uh, Kaushal, and Suresh. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, so I can yeah, go through. So I'll take the questions uh, one by one as they appear on my chat box. So the first question is from Yogesh. He's written, how can one choose the appropriate valuation model for their startup? And what are the important things apart from the money needed while doing the valuation? You know, uh, the objective of doing the valuation, Yogesh, is that you need the money. Otherwise, why will you go for a valuation game at the early stage startup? Um, so like I said, uh, the important things, the three important things that you need to be considering when you are looking for a valuation, A is your team, B is the growth. Uh, and of course, you know that size of the problem that you're trying to solve. How can one choose the appropriate valuation model for their startup? Most of the Excel sheet, like, like I said, VCs do not, most of the times do not follow any valuation model. It's like a discussion or a negotiation that goes on, but, there is a story that's always written. That story is woven around the DCF valuation model, which is discounted cash flow valuation model. Um, there is a lot of material on the internet that's there about the DCF valuation model, how it can be applied to a startup. Um, like I said, one of the most important thing to be considered here is the growth rate. You also need to, you know, uh, really segment the expenses that are into move them from operating cash flow operating expenses to the capital expenses um so that's the most important thing that you need to do when you're actually looking at the valuation model a uh, lot of times there are relative valuation model or comparable valuation models that are used always so when you're using a comparable valuation model always choose a firm that is 
and if you're valuing use, using a comparable as a listed firm which is very closer to the business that you are doing and an early stage listed firm do not take a established listed firm because their growth rates are very less so your comparables will be uh, very different than them Oshil says, hello, ma'am. Can you also share some viewpoint about the term pre-series A funding? So uh, this funding actually happens in different stages as in when you keep on moving from you know, one stage to another. Like I said, pre-seed funding is when you only have the idea and the team needs money to actually you know, start. Some startups lead the funding at the seed stage when they have a certain idea about how they're going to solve the problem, um, then you know their series A comes when you have a product pro prototype ready. Um, then you move to series B when you have a certain customers, you're getting certain amount of revenue, and then you move to the uh, later series C and then C++. So this is how this funding uh, happened. So Rish um, says, that I was wondering if there is any risk to the entrepreneur if the company is overvalued. Um, so I can't think of any risk to the entrepreneur if the company is overvalued, though. Um, though there actually there is a little amount of risk that if the company is overvalued and if you go to the next round of funding, you may not get the funding. Okay, and if the valuation decreases, it sends a very negative signal to the market. All right, but, and that is why these VCs have figured out this multi-stage and it's not come like now, it has happened. This process has evolved over a period of time. There are a lot of iterations that have happened in this uh, VC funding game that's happening. Uh, so yes, the overvaluation can hamper even the flip card valuation came down at a certain point of time but they needed the money and they actually bite the bullet so these things happen uh, but the important thing for an entrepreneur at any stage is to concentrate on how much money that they would need to get to the next round of funding they should have an idea and they should get that if they are not able to the next reach to the next stage of funding they will be wiped out. Second, they need to have a VC which can actually connect them to the next stage of funding. So those are the two most important things that any startup should actually consider. That's wonderful, Shalu. So there are a couple of more queries uh, which arrive uh, out of discussions when we are going into valuation things like how should they split their shares uh, and what should be uh, the paid of capital, uh, the ideal paid of capital, if you can highlight that as well. So, um, you know, the, the like I said, these um, I actually spoke to a couple of VCs and I also spoke to one or two founders about how the valuation of startups happen. And that's actually, you know, like I said, when I started preparing the deck, I had the valuation models. And that's what I told Priyanjali, I'll be telling about the valuation models, right? As an academician, you want to talk about, okay, what are the models, how they can be implemented, and you look at that. Then I spoke to one or two VCs, I spoke to one or two founders, actually, how does it happen? And they say, told me, no, no, we don't even look at these valuation models. And uh, that's when I, you know, changed the slide. I said, okay, this is not going to work. Uh, I need to have something which is not, you know, it has to be backed by academic orientation, but it has to tell them what actually happens in the real world. So uh, the equity, again, is a negotiation game, right? And um, that's how the things work. Like I said, if you look at it, even in the Shark Tank, if you have a business, where more than one VCs are willing to invest, you can actually give a lesser amount of equity. But if you have only, you know, the lesser number of VCs are interested, you'll have to dilute more equity. The important thing at that point of time, and I'm I reiterating that again and again, is to figure out that you get the right amount of funding to reach to the next stage. So don't bother at that, you know, I'm not saying don't bother, but that should be your secondary uh, worry should be, 
look at okay how much equity is getting diluted the primary should be am i getting enough money to sustain to the next level i think that's that's wonderful golden words that uh, starters hold basically nothing more than their equity which they can of course leverage and, and move to the next uh, stage of growth any any highlights would you like to put on on the uh, uh, amount of esops or things they should go ahead with the employees because right now they are not in a paying capacity also they do not hold a, a great uh, salaries but they want the best of experts to join their teams and for growth and scaling so yeah so for a startup uh, when they hire an employee i think for an employee the greater attraction is uh, to get a you know share of the pie rather than the salary of course the salaries do matter but um, i think the more, a bigger attraction is to get the share of the pie rather than you know the salaries so esop are an important factor of the startups there's no shying away from it uh, so there has to be a few consideration a you will your equity will get diluted as you move on onto the next round of funding uh, so you need to keep a certain percentage of you need to have an estimate how many employees are going to be there in your core team so your core team cannot change and the core team need to have enough share to keep them stay put you also need to have an estimate how many employees you're going to hire in the next few years and how much equity you're going to dilute it to the uh, employees in the next few rounds of when you do to do the hiring so keeping and of course you know a certain amount of equity will go to the vcs they will go to the angel investors micro vcs so all these estimations need to be done before you know you figure out how much esop needs to be given to the employees i think that's that's again uh, a very valuable uh, inputs you have uh, shared with us uh, everyone i request if you have any other questions uh, we have tried to keep these sessions very limited not a long sessions and we'll come back again so shalu is part of aic we can again have a couple of set of your questions have another class uh, or discussion on valuation so this this whole session purpose is to have speed discussions and speed mentoring so if you have any any further questions with chalu you can put forward uh, we'll get back to you again maybe if you have some questions later we are sharing a feed of uh, this uh, feedback form with you the purpose of course is to have uh, a couple of your your inputs how we can make it uh, more connected also uh, to have your information with us so that we can come back again i'll also request all of you to switch on your cam for a while so that we can take a group photograph if that's possible uh, that will be a, a memory to have the first speed mentoring session with chalu and uh, let us have a great beginning together all right i think they, there are people at home and not able to switch on their cam no worries so i'll just take a uh, camera picture. shy people all right so we have we can see the faces great 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 to see everyone here <laughs> nice all right okay so i uh, here i go with the first pick couple of more if you want uh, if a uh, few more faces come up i'll take few more pics <laughs> Okay, here we have some more pics. Great, great. So uh, stay connected with us on LinkedIn. We'll keep posting for the next sessions. We are open for any feedback. What sessions and what kind of interaction you would you like to have with the next mentor? So let's have a in, like in, like this. This series should not be a monotonous class. This is more for its resulting issues. Shalu is very happy to join here, and we are glad and honored to have a, a an expert like Shalu with us. So maybe next time again, we have some very great questions and interactions. Thank you, Shalu, for taking out this time for speaking to these uh, uh, kids and and startup founders. That was amazing, and I think your your information and your insightfulness on valuation will will help them a lot in the uh, next steps for their business. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Shima. It was very nice interacting. With Same here. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye, Shalu. Bye. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.